This morning's text is found in Psalms chapter 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His host. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created, and He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling His command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for His people. Praise for all His saints. For the people of Israel who are near to him, praise the Lord. I'm going to begin a series today that, God willing, will take us from uh, the creation of the world through God's dealings with Israel up to the incarnation on December 20th in 10 Messages with a little interlude for Missions Week at the end of October. Today we're going to look at God, the Creator, and then next Sunday, the emergence of sin and misery into the world through the fall. Then, God's covenant with Abram. Then the exodus from Israel. The giving of the law at Sinai the wilderness wandering, the conquest of Canaan, the emergence of the Davidic kingdom, the prophetic expectation of the coming of the Lord and his final appearance in Jesus Christ who is the fulfillment of all God's promises and through whom we utter the amen to God for his glory. That's the plan and I believe that the Lord has given it to me as a plan because there is nothing like knowing our God as creator and our God as worker through history that builds faith and kindles hope like this. It's no secret that my desire for this congregation and for myself is that our joy and our faith advance. That we set our hope fully on God and not on man or on anything. And I've learned from the Bible and from experience that it doesn't work to say to people, love God, adore God, fear God, period, and expect it just to happen as a kind of mechanical response to a command. Authentic love and adoration and awesome fear of the Lord is kindled and happens in the heart when we see God in His acts in history and in the way He plans to act in the future. And therefore, I think the calling of a pastor is not just to say, love God, adore God, fear God, but rather... My calling as pastor, whose aim is to kindle faith and stir up hope in God, is to say, look. Look at the cosmos coming into being out of nothing. Look at God subjecting the whole creation to futility according to His own will in hope. Look at the great condescension of God coming down to choose one solitary Aramean, Abram, through whom all the families of the world will be blessed. Look at God parting the Red Sea so his people can walk over on dry ground and getting glory over Pharaoh by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. 
Look at God's lightning and the crash of his thunderous voice at Sinai as he gives his will and his holy name. Look at him spread a table in the wilderness where nobody else could give food, providing for rebellious people all they need. Look at him part the Jordan. Look at the walls of Jericho and all the cities crash before Israel as the Lord fights for them. And then look at these people, in spite of everything, rejecting the Lord as their king and saying, give us a man for a king. We want a man so we can be like all the nations. And God, in complete and amazing mercy, not rejecting his people, but for his own name's sake, giving them that king and through that very line, promising to bring a redeemer who would banish ungodliness from Jacob and purchase redemption for the world. That's what we want to look at for ten weeks together. And he is a great God in all those deeds. And I think if we see him, we will be stronger in faith. The tree of our faith, this little sapling that gets tossed back and forth, is going to gain root and strong fiber so that the winds of temptation morally and doctrinally won't blow us over so easily. My calling as pastor is to live and to preach for the advancement and the joy of your faith, for the kindling of your hope in God. And I know from Romans 15:4 that everything in the Old Testament was written for our instruction that through the steadfastness and an encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So ultimately, it's the main point of every message because it's the main point of the whole Old Testament. And the most hopeful thing in all the world is that the God with whom we have to do today is the God of the Bible. In that Old Testament with all its mighty acts. If we come to know him, our little sapling will take on some strong fiber and deep root. May the Lord strengthen my hand this fall to preach it as it's worthy. And may he open your eyes to see all of his greatness and his mercy. Today, God as creator. The foundation of all redemptive history is this sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's why we begin our creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And by that we mean that God Almighty created out of nothing all that is not God. Nothing but God the Son and God the Spirit is co-eternal with God. Otherwise, we would have two gods if we had to reckon with anything else as co-eternal with God. There is one God, and therefore the ultimate origin of all things is He. For as Paul says, from Him and through Him and to Him, are all things. To Him be glory forever and ever. But since He is one God in three persons, we also believe and confess with the Scriptures, as was read, Christ is the image of the living God, the firstborn over all creation, for by Him were all things created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. God the Father, through the agency of the Son, created out of nothing all that is not God. Out of nothing, we say. That's the great mystery of creation. How can something come out of no thing? And yet Paul says, God calls into being things that are not as though they were. Or as the psalm says, he commanded and they were created. God 
addresses his command to nothingness. And it obeys and becomes something. An amazing mystery. If you ever start to doubt the word of God, addressed to you in your need, think on this. God can issue a command that is so powerful when there is nothing to obey it, it creates an obeyer out of nothing. It will be obeyed. I think that's the way we all became Christians. If all that is not God came into being at the word of God, then it follows that every second, every moment, of our existence is owing to the Word of God. This I find one of the most amazing things to think about in relation to the doctrine of creation. Biblical teaching is not that when God finished creation, creation was over. That at the beginning, when He brought into being man and all animals and plants and the world and the heavens and the earth and the seas, that that was the end of His creative work. The biblical teaching rather is that no creature has within himself a principle of ongoing existence, but is held in being millisecond by millisecond by the Word of God. Hebrews 1.3 Christ reflects the glory of God, bears the very stamp of His nature, upholding all things by the Word of His power. If God should cease to address you, and your body and soul with the command, Be! You'd cease to be. You are held in being to the end of this service because God is addressing your body and soul with the command, Stay and be. The only barrier between me and nothingness is the command of the Almighty. I wonder if we have even begun to plumb the depths of the saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And since that same divine word that brought all things into being also holds all things in being, moment by moment, the scriptures don't treat creation as a finished act but rather every new life that emerges is treated as a special creation of God. For example, Psalm 104, verse 29 says of the animals, When thou, God, hidest thy face, they are dismayed. When thou takest away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. And then thou renewest the face of the ground. The same thing is said about men in Ecclesiastes 12.1. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. Not Adam's creator only, your creator. And Isaiah is even more specific. Woe to him who strives with his maker, an earthen vessel with the potter. Does the clay say to him who fashions it, What are you making? Or, your work has no handles. In other words, we relate to God as Creator just as much as if He had made us like He made Adam out of the dust of the ground. And it doesn't matter that we are largely composed of the union of sperm and egg and the multiplication of cells through nutrition and molecular activity Because all these processes are so completely sustained moment by moment and governed by the ongoing creative word of God that we are as much clay in the potter's hands as was Adam. So the biblical doctrine, or if you prefer, the picture of God that is before us is this. God the Father, through the agency of the Son created out of nothing all that is not God by the word of His command. And that word 
so completely sustains and holds in being all things that every being that emerges is the peculiar creation of God. And now I want to ask, what is the implication of this for our life? And I want to just mention three things this morning, although I think a dozen things could be mentioned. If you start to just reflect on the doctrine of creation, it affects everything. But I'll just mention three things. First, if God is the creator of all things, out of nothing, then he owns all things and all people. Absolutely. The scripture infers ownership from creation. For example, Psalm 95.5, the sea is his for he made it. Psalm 89.11, the heavens are thine, the earth also is thine, the world and all that fills it, thou hast founded them. Psalm 24.1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who fill it. God owns all things Absolutely. Now, we may consider ourselves owners, say, of, of this suit, in relation to other people. And what we mean by that is no other human may take these things without just compensation. And that's true. That's the way God has set up the world. We may never think of ourselves in relation to God in that way. He owes us nothing and we and our so-called possessions are totally at his disposal. They are his, absolutely. And we have nothing that we can call our own in relation to God. This means that in regard to possessions, we are what is commonly called stewards, or more modern word, trustees of God's estate. And in relation to ourselves, it means that we are slaves of the Almighty. He owns us and may do with us what he pleases. It is very wrong to say, a tithe of my income is God's and the 90% is mine. That's bad theology. It is all God's, absolutely. We have no rights whatsoever to dispense with any of our money but what pleases the Lord. We must ask of every expenditure, is this purchase achieving the purposes of my owner, its owner, our Creator? Not only does God own our possessions, but He owns us, absolutely. We are the clay, He is the potter, and we can be done with by him exactly as he pleases, no questions asked. Paul said, Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me thus? Has the potter no right over the clay? The answer to that question is yes. He has absolute right over the clay. And here you can take your spiritual temperature. If this doctrine is sweet to your taste, if you delight to submit yourselves to the ownership of God and let Him do with you as you please, as He pleases, that's a mark of spiritual maturity. And you can give thanks to the Lord. But if this doctrine is offensive to you, if you resent the thought of Him owning you and being able to do with you exactly as He pleases, no questions asked, then that's a mark that you are in the grips of the power of the flesh and need to repent. For the very essence of the flesh is brazen self-assertion, the will to be autonomous, the desire to assert our rights over against God, and to maintain the determination of our own life. But the rise of faith in the heart means the collapse of all self-determination and the giving up
to the sovereignty of God all that he wants to do with us. The marrow, the marrow of saving faith is total surrender to the absolute sovereign ownership of God. The laying down of arms, the arms of self-determination. The second implication of God as our creator is that everything that is has a purpose. First, he owns everything and has a right over everything and every person to do with us as he pleases. And second, God has a purpose in everything. If God did not create the world, then there is no purpose in the world. Every man's purpose is as good as another man's purpose. Every man's aim and desire is as valid as another's. And the only meaning in life is what you assert and achieve and create by doing your own thing. And that, in essence, is where we are in America today. Where there is no creator, each man's right is right, ultimately. But if there is a creator, then there is an absolute purpose which we can find in God's revelation because God is not whimsical, He is not frivolous, and His purpose is never in jeopardy, for He says, My counsel shall stand, I will accomplish my purpose, says the Lord. The ultimate purpose in creation is not kept secret in the Bible either. It's stated again and again. God's purpose in creation is to display His glory. He says in Numbers 14.21 that to fill the earth with the glory of God is just as certain to come about as the existence of God. As I am, says the Lord, and as I will fill the earth with my glory. And Isaiah 43, 7 says, I created Israel for my glory. And Ephesians 1, 6, 12, and 14 say, Rebellious creatures are redeemed for this purpose to the praise of His glory. So since God created everything and owns everything, we must ask of every action and purchase and attitude, is this achieving the purpose of my owner? Now that we know the purpose, we can change the question to be, is every purchase, is every act, is all my attitude achieving the display of the glory of God? That's the second implication of the doctrine of creation. God has a purpose for everything, and it is this, that His glory be displayed in all the world. Third and finally, the doctrine of creation implies that we are totally and utterly dependent upon God for everything. We are weaker than the weakest little baby in relation to God because except for God's sustaining word we fly into nothingness not just weakness every breath we take every calorie of energy that we expend every good intention that we fulfill moment by moment is a gift from an all sustaining holy merciful creator who owes us absolutely nothing and so the lesson, I think, thirdly, is clear. You can't glorify God unless you become like a little child and give up all the efforts to sustain yourself and depend wholly on your Father for everything. And that closes the circle, so we sum it up. The foundation of all redemptive history is this. God the Father, through the agency of the Son, created out of nothing all that is not God by the word of His command. And that word so completely sustains and holds in being all that is that any being that emerges is the unique and peculiar creation of God. And therefore, He owns everything and has absolute right to do with everything as He pleases. And therefore, what pleases Him is the fulfillment of His purpose. And we've seen that His purpose is to glorify Himself in all that happens 
And we've seen that it is impossible for a helpless and weak creature to glorify his all-sufficient and all-sustaining maker unless he is willing to become like a little child, not be anxious for anything, and as Peter says, and trust his soul to a faithful creator. Let's pray together. Almighty Father, we bow in trembling awe before this astonishing truth of yourself as our maker. It would frighten us to death were you not also our redeemer. Oh, what a blessed thing it is to be able to follow a message of your absolute right over us with the communion of our Lord's Supper that shows that your will for us and your intention for us is salvation. We do not resist your purpose to glorify yourself. We submit to it. We do not resist your ownership over us. We submit to it. We lay ourselves down on your knees like little children. We're glad to give up our anxieties and roll them onto you. And we're glad, Father, to entrust our souls to a faithful creator and to thank you that Jesus came into the world to die for us and that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.